Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It is good to be back with you. I'm trying to work through some technical difficulties with our PowerPoint this morning. So if that comes together, great. But you're just going to have to depend on your Bibles, uh, which is probably a good idea in any case. We are traveling our way, slowly though it is true, through Luke. And in fact, today we are finishing Luke chapter 1. What a day indeed. We are in part 7 of our series through Luke and Acts. I'm estimating maybe a thousand messages, so we'll figure it out when we get there. Uh, and really, what what I want us to see as we travel through this broad narrative is what did the early church to whom Luke was writing receive and understand through this investigative reporting that Luke undertakes in Luke and Acts. And the chapter finishes in, well, in a different way. It begins with, uh, or I should say, it follows the naming of John the Baptist. It's been a couple weeks since we've been in Luke, so to catch you up to speed, John the Baptist has been born, and at the closing moments of his birth, the way the Jews did it is they would wait eight days. That was the tradition. That was the rule. Eight days after the birth, they would name the child and circumcise the child. And so on that eighth day, John is circumcised. His father, Zechariah, who has been unable to speak for the entirety of the pregnancy, writes his name is John on a tablet and his lips are opened. Then his father, we pick it up in verse 67, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David. Just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago, now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant. The covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell His people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide us to the path of peace. John grew up and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. So, Zechariah is doing something interesting here in the midst of prophecy. And what he is doing is, is really encapsulating the purpose of God's people and announcing that that purpose has come to its fulfillment. Or at least that that fulfillment is approaching its arrival. Or I should say, his arrival. We see in verse 67 and 68 that, that Zechariah is actually in the midst of praise, which I think is important. If you remember back last time we spoke, Zechariah gains his, his ability to speak, and what Scripture says is instantly Zechariah could speak again, and he began praising God. And so this prophecy is actually praise to God, right? He begins, verse 68, 
Praise the Lord, the God of Israel. And, and, and sort of sets us in this understanding. Zechariah's posture with this prophecy is one of thanksgiving. He is rejoicing in what God has done with the arrival of John into the world. And I want to just kind of walk through the passage a little bit to, to point out the various ways that Zechariah, as I said, is sort of encapsulating this moment in history as the culmination of what God's people were really all about in the first place. He has sent us a mighty Savior, verse 69, from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now, David was the man. He was the Michael Jordan of God's people. He was the Babe Ruth. He was the hero. And so David was one of the first kings, really the second king, but the first king after God's own heart, according to Scripture, the king selected by God according to God's desires for what the king of Israel, God's people, would be like. And David was, by and large, an incredible king, conquering the enemies of God's people and establishing their kingdom for years to come. And at the end of his life, David, realizing that all of his success, all of his nation, all everything about his life had come from God, decided that he wanted to build a special temple for God. For those of you who maybe have some familiarity with how God interacted with the nation of Israel throughout the ages, you'll maybe remember that when they left enslavement in Egypt, we find that story in Exodus, God had them create a place of worship called the tabernacle. It was a tent that they essentially just moved around the desert with them and set up wherever they camped, and that was where they would go to worship God. And in David's time, which was hundreds of years later, that tent was still in use, that same tent. And we don't really have any record of them repairing it or replacing it, so... For hundreds of years, that tent has been in use. And David says, you know, I want to honor God. I want to build a house for God permanently in the midst of this kingdom he has built for us in Jerusalem. And God is so impressed and so moved by David's desire to build a a house for the Lord that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we get this, this response from God to David's desire to build this temple to God. And God sends the prophet Nathan to David with sort of his joy that David is so faithful. We'll pick up part of it that that really Zechariah is referencing in his prophecy here in Luke chapter 1. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 11. Furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. So David wants to build a house for the Lord. The Lord comes back and actually says, well, that's, I love that you want to do that. We're going to have your son do that. But he is still oh, so overjoyed by David's desire, by David's heart, that he says, we'll actually build a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors... I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name. And I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. You know, sometimes with prophecy, you'll see there are multiple fulfillments. And so on one hand, Nathan, the prophet here, is talking about Solomon. David's son, who indeed goes forward and builds the temple. But ultimately, Nathan is talking about Jesus. His son, who will build a temple not of stone, but of his own body. 
And, and that is exactly what Zechariah is pointing to. He is sent to say, mighty Savior. Your Bible might say something a little bit different. It might say, a horn of salvation. If, you, if your Bible says, a horn of salvation, raise your hand. It's okay. Don't be embarrassed. Now, why it says a horn of salvation, while others might say a mighty Savior or something along this line, is this is prophecy, right? That's what it says. And in prophecy, a horn generally means it's an image for a throne or a kingdom. So a horn of salvation is a throne of salvation or a, a king of salvation. Or as my Bible translation puts it, a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. So Zechariah is saying, look, remember our hero David? How God promised this son that would rule and have everlasting, an everlasting kingdom? All that, this is happening. Now is that time. Nathan's words, as well as the words of other prophets, we could show you a dozen different times that... These exact concepts were shared by prophets in the Old Testament are coming to fruition. Zechariah continues, verse 72. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant. The covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. So, notice what's happening here. He begins, Zechariah's prophecy begins by saying, well, David and the promise God made to David is being fulfilled. But then he continues, that's not all. Remember Abraham, you know, the, the, the founder of this whole Israel group, who is the father of us all. The promises God made to Abraham are about to be fulfilled as well. And and we could go to a number of places in Genesis where God makes promises to Abraham, but the first promise God makes to Abraham is probably the most apropos. It's found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. At this point, Abraham is still going by the name Abram. And in fact... This is the first moment he arrives on the scene of the biblical narrative. And the first thing that happens to him is, seemingly from nowhere, God speaks to him. Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So this promise God makes to Abram, which indeed Abram follows. He goes to the place, leaves everything behind that God showed him, and God has been faithful now to that promise. We read some of that faithfulness occurring, God's faithfulness, I mean, occurring in Genesis, but Zechariah's claim is that promise made thousands of years ago is now coming to fruition here in this day. And in some small way, his little son John is connected to it. I love the tenderness of, in the midst of this prophecy, he is announcing these incredible moments, these fulfillments of God's promises that have been in evidence for millennia. And in the midst of it, he's my little son. I love the tenderness there of, of Zechariah. Will be called the prophet of the Most High because he will prepare the way for the Lord. From here, really, Zechariah's prophecy is about sort of saying to God's people Israel what the point of them was really all along. And you'll notice that so far, just here in these few verses, Zechariah has really captured the entirety of the nation of Israel. Right? He begins referencing Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12. 
which is, the, he's the father of Israel. Literally from the first moment, he, Zechariah's prophecy is addressing, look, it began with Abraham and the promises God made to Abraham. And then he, he describes David when God's people go from nomadic sheep herders and a sort of scattered assortment of family tribes to a kingdom with a central government and real power in a region of the earth. And finally, it arrives here, culminating in the life of John the Baptist. And really, what Zechariah's prophecy, it actually covers, I don't have a physical Bible with me, but if you just stick your finger, if you stick your finger into the Bible and you open it up to Genesis chapter 12, Here's Genesis chapter 12. And then you flip it all the way over to Acts chapter 8. Zechariah's prophecy, for those of you, it, it's talking about the, everything that happens in the Bible in this. The rest of the Bible is just that little bit and that little bit. Everything out, this whole bit is about Israel, God's people. And Zechariah's prophecy is addressing this whole section and saying this is the point of that whole bit of the Bible that would probably take you, I don't know, a couple days to read if you had nothing else going on. And he's saying that this is the point. The reason you're here, my little son, the reason for all of the promises, all of the prophecies, everything, this is it. He says he's going to prepare the way for the Lord. And, and, and we see that, again, in prophecy. Listen. Isaiah 40, verse 3 through 5. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. This is it. This is the fulfillment. This is what John's here to announce. Prepare the way. And his prophecy ends with the point of it all. The point of that big bulk of the Bible. Why John was born in the first place begins verse 77. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. The point of that thousands of years of history, that entire culture, that entire nation, that entire people group, all the kings, all the prophets, all the judgments, all the blessings, all of it, It was just simply that people find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. The shame and the guilt that everyone in history has experienced. All of it. And that entire nation. All of it was so that this one person could arrive and offer freedom from that guilt. Freedom from that shame. Why? Because of God's tender mercy. The morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. I love that line. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. The entire nation all its history, all the scriptures, all of it, for this simple moment that a person would come, be light in darkness, offer freedom from guilt, offer freedom from the shadow of death. That's the whole point. And that's what Zechariah's prophecy is pointing to. All of it. 
This people, if you remember from earlier on, we, we recounted the, the genealogies, we recounted the, the, the history of the people, all that history that they memorized, all the scripture. It's right here in this moment is Zechariah's prophecy. It was all for this. And as I was thinking about this prophecy and thinking about you know, how much effort and work and years and, and centuries and families and, and all of it that, that was all for this moment, the arrival of Jesus. Man, I, I started to think, well, okay, what, what's the point of it all? You know? How many lives came and went? How many people, Abraham and David included, received promises but didn't get to see the arrival of this person? And I started to think about my own life. How, what was it all about? You know, what, what, why did I go to all those church services? Why did I fall asleep in all of those sermons? Why did I eat snacks in all those church services? What, what, what was it all about? And, and the answer for each of us is the same as Zechariah's prophecy. Simply. That we would find salvation and forgiveness of our sins. That someone would shine a light, the dawning light of heaven, into the shadow of death that we live under. That's it. Just for that singular hope. And as we... Turn over to chapter 2 of Luke. We will find that that hope has a name. Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word and how it leads us and guides us, that shares with us the lifetimes and experiences of countless individuals who gave it all for a singular, simple hope. And so we thank you, Jesus, for being our hope as well. Amen.